Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our Wednesday night Bible study. And as we do so, again, I want to give thanks again to Miss Mackenzie Glasser for uh, helming all of these videos. Well, not all of them, but uh, these ones that we do down here. I uh, appreciate all her labors. I uh, mostly said that just to embarrass her. Now, as we do begin uh, to get into our Bible study tonight, we're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. And as we do so, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you called us together to serve you today, God, we ask that you would help our souls, that you would strengthen us by the word that you have provided for your saints from generation to generation. And to God, I ask your mercy to be with each one of us. May your Holy Spirit strengthen us, not only in our knowledge of the truth, but most especially in our love for you. For to God, you have called us to a life of holiness and a life of service unto our fellow man. And to God, as we consider the many ways that you've given to us, even during this time of coronavirus, to look after your ways, God, we especially pray that you uh, would uh, encourage us to repent of our sins, to turn unto you, to find peace and comfort in your law and in your commandments. For to God, they show forth your wisdom and your grace. Dear God, we know that you've given unto us uh, these particular uh, commandments that we might show the world what it means to love the Lord our God. Dear God, as we pray for these particular things, to God, we continue to pray uh, for this congregation of the Lord. Uh, that your hand will be upon your covenant children. To God, that they uh, might again once more return unto you. And to God, not only return unto you, but to God, we pray for that remnant uh, which you have left in uh, your kingdom. To God, we pray that they would go forth proclaiming the good news of your word. To God, that they would testify to their friends and family and neighbors and loved ones that this is life. Loving Jesus. Loving the world that you have created. And longing to be in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And to God, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today, again, we are turning once more to the book of Zechariah. And as I've shared the last several weeks, again, it is right before the book of Malachi, which is right before the book of Matthew. And Zechariah is a long book of the minor prophets, which, of course, are minor, not in uh, their place, uh, but just in size in comparison to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Uh, of course, ironically, Zechariah is, is longer than the book of Daniel, but here he is in uh, this collection, and we continue tonight to look at the visions that he has in the midst of his prophecy. And today, we are finding the prophet Zechariah uh, in somewhat of a trance. And uh, we're going to go ahead and just take this verse by verse rather than reading all 14 verses at one time. But again, I encourage you to open your Bibles there to the book of Zechariah and let us read the word of our Lord. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. Let's read that again. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. So here we have Zechariah who, as I noted, is in a trance or is in some way distracted from the spoken words of the angel. And so here we see the angel, who we know to be the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, have to come and kind of snap him out of it, right? Awaken him, as it says. And waken me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. Now, we hear this, and I think we can immediately apply it unto our own life. How often does the Holy Spirit need to awaken us out of our spiritual slumbers? And not just spiritual slumbers, but our 
or the ease in which we become distracted by the things of the world and do not spend the time that we should with the word of the living God. And sometimes you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, and again, you Bethany people will have heard me say this before, but I think it's a good illustration. Sometimes we need the two by four of the Holy Spirit to come and whomp us on the back of the head. In other words, we need uh, the assistance of the Holy Spirit to refocus us and listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have something of like happening. Zechariah is awakened like a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And so now his eyes are open. He's ready to hear what Jesus has to say. And he said to me, the angel said to me, what do you see? And Zechariah responds, so I said, I am looking. So his eyes are focused, he's looking, and what does he see? A lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Now, Zechariah is going to ask the question in verse 4, what are these, my Lord? And then in verse 5, the angel is going to say, do you not know what these are? And Zechariah is going to respond, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you should become a plain. And he should bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands thou shall finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For he who has despised the day of small things, for these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, they are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Amen. So we have a prophecy. We have the prophet asking Jesus to clarify, and we have Jesus clarifying. Now let's look at some of the images in the vision. The first thing that Zechariah sees is a lampstand of solid gold. Now, what does a lampstand represent? Well, what does a lampstand do? Right, this isn't rocket science, right? A lampstand holds a lamp. Right? And what does a lamp do? It shines brightly in the darkness. Before the era of electric lights, uh, before uh, we were able to flip a switch and, and, and have brightness in a room, right, you had to have a lamp, and the lamp needed some fuel in order to light. Now, for most of American history, what did we use? Whale oil, right? That's what was so big about, you know, Gloucester, Massachusetts, and cities like it, right? There was these great whaling fleets that would sail the seven seas. And of course, probably the most famous of all those whaling ships was what ship? Right, the ship that went after Moby Dick, right? And I... You know, this has nothing to do with Zechariah, but it's really worth spending the time sitting down and reading Moby Dick. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that Herman Melville knew his Bible, and Herman Melville knew his Presbyterian theology. And if you pay attention to Moby Dick, it is very much uh, in keeping uh, with a Presbyterian understanding of how the world works. But anyway, you know, whale oil is the what was the the source of most of our uh, lamps. And it, it wasn't expensive, but it wasn't cheap. And so it was something you had to take care of, right? And it was something that you had to make sure that you didn't overuse. So we also had, you know, wax candles that did the duty of bringing light into a room. And of course, back in the days of Zechariah, it was no different. Right? You needed a some kind of oil to fuel these things. Well, notice what it says about the lampstand. 
The lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, right? And what's the bowl for? To hold the, the oil, right? And the bowl, and what, what does it say about the bowl? And on the stand, there were seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. So if you think, for instance, of a menorah, okay, you know what a menorah looks like, right? Well, think of, think of there being a central bowl you know, with a lamp, on a lampstand, right? And there are seven uh, pipes going out, right? And at the end of every pipe is what? A lamp, right? A light. Now, notice what it says next in verse 3. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl, and another left. So there are these two trees of olives. And what do you think the olive trees are there for? To provide the oil for the lamps, right? And so what we see here is a kind of a perpetual motion machine, right? We have lamps, we have pipes, we have a bowl, and we have trees. And the trees are constantly refilling the bowl, and the bowl is constantly you know, sending this oil to the lamps, which are burning and giving light. Now think about a similar illustration in the New Testament. One that doesn't necessarily involve lampstands. What is Jesus Christ uh, illustrated as? Right? He's illustrated as a fountain that never ceases, right? And why does he never cease? Because the rivers of grace, the rivers of righteousness are always refilling the fountain, right? Well, this is exactly what this is supposed to represent. It's supposed to represent the eternal nature of God's gift of grace and righteousness unto his covenant people. Now, there's also something else going on here. What does a lampstand in the temple represent? It obviously represents light, but think about the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, what does Jesus warn the seven churches about? That if they go against his word, if they countenance evil, if they promote wickedness, if they allow sin to go on unmortified in their presence, what is Jesus going to do? Jesus is going to remove the lampstand. And what does a removal of the lampstand leave a church with? Darkness, right? And what does darkness represent in the Bible? Darkness represents the absence of God. Right? The absence of the protective mercy and grace of God. So destruction would follow. And so when we think of the lampstand here, we're meant to think as New Testament believers of its presence in the new temple you know, set up you know, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're especially meant to think of it in the context of how Jesus uses this passage in the book of Revelation. So here we have these lampstands. They're set up. Zechariah asks what this means. And here we have an immediate application to the situation in the days of Zechariah. All right? So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now, who is Zerubbabel? Does anybody remember who Zerubbabel is? When you go back to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? You go back and you look and you read and what do you find out? For instance, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, uh, verse 14, Ezekiel will also reference the uh, reference Zerubbabel. He says there in 37, uh, 14, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Now think about why that references Zerubbabel. Right? When was Ezekiel prophesying? Ezekiel was prophesying in the days of the exile. And Ezekiel 37 is talking about a future event. Well, what's happening here in Zechariah, right? Zechariah prophesying about something that's happening, right? Zerubbabel is one of the leaders of the group that God has put together 
to rebuild the temple and to reestablish Jerusalem. And so the fulfillment of Ezekiel is taking place here in Zechariah. And Zerubbabel is going to be enabled by the hand of the Lord to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city of David, Jerusalem. Now notice what happens. Not by my might, nor by my power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So how is Zerubbabel going to accomplish all these things? By the work of the Holy Spirit. Here we see yet another example of the Trinity at work in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God, given by God the Father and God the Son, is enabling this work to go forward. Because remember, what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, there's a lot of naysayers. There's a lot of people who are actively trying to destroy the work of the temple. And it's not so much that they're physically, you know, down there with uh, hammers breaking whatever Zerubbabel builds, but they are mocking Zerubbabel. They are denying the sufficiency of the temple by saying, well, this temple isn't as good as the temple that Solomon built. And outwardly, that was true. But what else do we know about what God requires of man? What does God desire? Mercy, not sacrifice. What would God rather have? A temple made with the hands of men or a temple made with the work of the Holy Spirit? Think how that applies to your own salvation, your own redemption purchased by Christ, the Christian life that you've been given to lead. What is God honored by? He's honored by believers who rest not in their own righteousness, not in the works of their own hands, but who understand that everything that they have is by his spirit. And we see this principle again come once uh, more forward in the book of Zechariah. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by my might, nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So here we see grace in the Old Testament, right? Mentioned twice. Here we see the mountain made flat. What does Jesus tell us about the power of prayer. What does it have the power to do? Prayer has the power to move mountains. What is God saying Zerubbabel is going to do? He's going to move a mountain and make it a plain. Right? This isn't mountaintop removal mining. Right? This is the removal of a mountain into a plain. Now think about what that represents as well. You know, what do you have to do to get to the top of a mountain? to climb, right? Now, how many of us are ready to go and climb a mountain? Well, Mackenzie's raising her hand, but <laughs> I'm not sure all of us are prepared to go do that, right? What's easier for us to do? Walk up a mountain or walk on a plane? Walk on a plane, right? So this is an example, again, of the nature of God's grace. Because if salvation was by works, how many of us would be able to climb that mountain? None of us, right? We would all be like the Greek um, uh, gentleman, uh, Sisyphus. Now, does anybody know his name? Right? He, he's the one, right, who had to push a rock up the mountain. And what happened when he got the rock to the top of the mountain? Right? The rock would roll back down, right? Right, yes. What, Mackenzie? Oh, uh, <laughs> Mackenzie was correcting my Greek mythology. It was Prometheus who pushed the thing up the top of the mountain and came back down. Sisyphus is the one who had his litter eaten every day and it was replaced. Um, thank you, Mackenzie, for helping. <laughs> so if our salvation is like that, right? We're never going to get there, right? Because we keep pushing our works up the hill and we're collapsed upon by our sin. But if the nature of grace, the na nature of salvation is of a plane, 
Well, again, God has done this work for us. Right? We walk into the celestial kingdom by his grace, by his power, by his spirit. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, right, Zechariah, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it, right? So it's an immediate application, right? An immediate application that this temple is getting built no matter what the naysayers say, no matter how much trouble you may find. Remember, the temple is getting built. So this is a word of encouragement, not just to Zerubbabel, but all those engaged in this labor, that God is going to see it completed. God is going to see it done. And that's a word of encouragement under the church. No matter what things might look like out in the world today, what is the promise we have? That Jesus Christ will complete his work. And when his work is completed, what's going to happen? Right? He's going to come back and glorify his saints. And so what are we to walk by? We're to walk by faith, not by sight. And we see this reaffirmed for us in this passage. Verse 11, that I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees of the right of the lamps and its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, <coughs> excuse me, do you not know what these are? And he said, no, my Lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So again, these uh, you know, lampstands are being fed uh, by these anointed ones. And who is the great anointed one? Jesus Christ. And so we here again have another vision of the Trinity. Right? The ones who stand on the left and the right. The Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. The second and third person of the Trinity here with the first person of the Trinity, the Lord of the whole earth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they are doing what? Refilling the lamp stand and ensuring that the lights stay on. And so as we close, that is the word of comfort that we have in this passage. Not only will the Lord accomplish the work that he has set forward to do, but we also are reminded that we are not to trust in our works, not to trust in our strength or our own power, but in the sufficiency of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that fountain that never ceases. And let us go forward again serving him in all that we do. Take care and have a blessed evening.